In recognition of the U.S. women's national team winning the World Cup, specifically your beer topic will focus on women in brewing. Our panelists are each going to tell you a beer story related to how women have been a significant part of the brewing industry. Pick the one who's telling the truth and you'll win our prize, free beer and a pint glass. Are you ready to play? I'm, I'm ready to go. Awesome. So your first story comes from Tim Hilton. Who I know never lies. By 2011, Martha Thompson, a beer-loving Australian turned American, was finally fed up with the objectification of women by the brewing industry. She was tired of seeing it everywhere, from the bedroom poster of the St. Pauli girl on her younger brother's wall, <laughs> all the way to that cold November day when her boyfriend held that double D imperial stout in his hand and its obtuse tagline, our double Ds are a mouthful. <laughs> I tell you, mate, he was like a chauvinist monster. Drinking, laughing, looking smug. I spit my posters and dump, uh, in his face and dumped the bloke right there. My only regret, wasted lager, said Martha satisfyingly as we sat on the patio of her thoroughbred brewery, Budgie Smuggler's Beer. If you don't know, a budgie smuggler is Australian for a male speedo. <laughs> Because it looks like he's smuggling a little budgie in there, says Martha, with a cheeky smile. A budgie is a small bird. It's also the logo for the brewery. Like, I figured I'd flip the script. Make the men the object of a beer. When buggers come to the bar and ask for a bevy, I look them up and down real slow. And I make a proper recommendation, she says. By the looks of you, you may fancy a little deck IPA. That's a little... Little deck, little like, a, deck. like a small patio. Like a, you do have a little deck. As it says on the label, it's the biggest thing you've had in your hand all day. <laughs> and your mate, he may like a cold water pilsner, she smiles. After all, as George Costanza taught us, women know about shrinkage. <laughs> right? What's next for Martha Thompson? <clears throat> Soon she'll be opening up a drive through coffee stand called Bean Bags. The stand will have a low-cut window and feature men serving coffee in Speedos. Their motto? We dip our beans in every cuppa, says Martha. All right. <laughs> all right, cheeky fuckers. <laughs> Martha Thompson opens Budgie Smuggler Beers from Tim Hilton is your first choice. Now we are going to hear from Prince. All right. Beer is old. Uh, very old. Dating back to the first mysterious moment when barley and wheat began to make its magic, the people behind the beer were women. From the goddesses of fermentation to the Egyptians and the Sumerians to the colonization of America, yes, women have been the backbone of brewing. And then something changed. Beer began to sell for profit and men stepped behind the brew kettles. With the development of the craft beer industry in the U.S., the vast majority of the new breweries are owned by men. However, a new upswing in female brewers is now taking place in the craft beer industry. Part of this upswing came to be attributed to the formation of the nonprofit, the Pink Boot Society, PBS, that supports women drinking in the brewing pr profession. I know what you're thinking. More use of the color pink to represent a women's movement. How cliche, right? But the Pink Boot Society is far beyond cliche. It raises money for scholarships for women to seek education in brewing. It gives women the opportunity to network with other female brewers. And it gives lonely, bearded, geeky male brewers a fighting chance to get a date. <laughs> That's true. <clears throat> Terry Farendorf, if I got your name wrong, I apologize. I'm sorry, I'm horrible with names. Uh, founded the Pink Boot Society after quitting her job and taking a five-month journey across America to 71 different breweries. She named it after the pink, oh, excuse me, after the pair of pink boots she brews and that were a gift from her mother-in-law. The PBS went on to create the International Women's Col uh, Collaboration Brew Day, held March 8th. Maybe you've recently had a Pink Boots collab from one of your favorite craft breweries, and if not, 
Grab one today. All right. So for the for the record, we did try to get Charlene from Badass Backyard. She was out of town. She's surfing the Oregon coast right now. Yes. Working hard. All the women have lives outside of brewing. All of us are just <laughs> left here around drinking beer and, and with our budgie at, smugglers. Right. Rachel at uh, TT's Brewing said, "I just don't like you guys very much." Right. I know. That's a problem. <laughs> Tim and Dave are now attending classes. To uh, it's called how to get along with other brewers, and, uh, <laughs> and we're working on that. So, I, I, so Rob, have, the, have they have they passed them yet? No, no, well, no, we have. No, yeah. Uh, the Pink Boots Society is bringing women back to brewing is your second choice. Your last story comes to you from Dave Basaraba. George Killian's Irish Red is a beer based upon an age-old recipe created by George Killian Lett of Lett's Brewery in Enniscorthy, Ireland. Or was it? It was well known in the town of Enniscorthy that Maggie Lett, his wife, was the better brewer in the family. Many in the town would flock to fill their grogs and pots with her home-brewed batches of beer. This infuriated George Killian. Although many of his beer recipes were based upon those created by his wife, he never gave her any credit. Irish beer historian Alana Kavanaugh explains what drew the final line in the sand for Maggie Killian. In February of 1936, Maggie created a beer that was like no other anyone had tasted. It was a lager with around 6.5% ABV, malty backbone and a smooth finish. But the color was as red as any had ever seen. When Maggie had George taste the lager, he smashed her barrels, stole her recipe, and brewed it at the Let's Brewery. Although George took credit for the beer, the people of Enniscorthy knew the truth. Maggie never brewed again. In 1980, George passed away at the age of 84, a poor man. Maggie, who was 20 years younger than George, became the sole owner of the Red Lager's recipe. The Let Brewery had long since closed. Spying her opportunity, Maggie approached Miller Coors with her recipe. They loved it and bought proprietary rights to brew the recipe under the George Killian name for $32.3 million. Speaking to reporters at the time, Maggie Lett stated, I told the bastards they can keep his name on the gum bean beer, but I'm taking all the fecking money. All right. <laughs> Rob, your hey, last Chris, choice. Chris, Chris, I have a complaint. Yes. I'm a Boston Irishman, and that would have been a much easier accent for me to learn than Australian. Right, right. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I play this in protest. Well, you know, we, we discussed that earlier, but we love to see you struggle. And so, Rod, here are your choices. You've got Martha Thompson opens budgie smuggler beers from Tim Hilton. You've got the Pink Boot Society is bringing women back to brewing from Prince, and you've got Maggie Lett created George Killian's Irish Red and the Bastard Stole It from Dave Basaraba. Which story do you choose? Well, this, this, is, this is a hard one because it's, it's obvious that, you know, from the, the, the wonderful accents that were portrayed here somewhat accurately. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what are you talking about? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, me fella. <laughs> but I'm going to have to go with the, the one that I know is true, which is the Pink Boots Society. And you are right. That is correct. Congratulations, That's a smart Rob. motherfucker right there. You got it right. You've won our prize. Free beer and a pine glass. Thanks for playing. Uh, that wraps up this part of our show. We'll now take a break and be back in a few with our special guest, Wendy Schuler, and a game we call Not My Beer. Welcome back to the brew house stage at Mountain Lakes Brewing Company in downtown Spokane, Washington. This is Wheat Wheat Don't Tell Me. It's time for a game we call Not My Beer with your host, Chris Sindrick. And now a game where we ask important people who drink beer questions about beer that their local craft brewer may not even know just to win an audience member some free beer. It's called Not My Beer. Tonight's guest has been the Eastern Washington University women's basketball head coach since the 2001 to 2002 season. 
She has been at the helm while the team has advanced to the Big Sky Conference Tournament in 15 of the 18 past seasons. Last year, the team earned the number six seed for the Big Sky Tournament Championship, where the Eagles went on to upset, get this, Weber State, Ohio, Idaho State, and Northern Colorado to advance to the Big Sky Championship game in thrilling fashion. But perhaps her most impressive feat is leading a competitive team to also be recognized as one of the top academic programs in the nation. The Eagles have earned the prestigious Women's Basketball Coaches Association Academic Top 25 Honor Roll in 17 of the 18 seasons that she has been the head coach. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's Not My Beer guest, EW Women's Basketball Head Coach, Wendy Schuler. <laughs> welcome, Wendy. It's great to have you on the show. How long have you been a craft beer fan? Many, many years. Many years. Yes. And, and so it begins when? Is it recent or is it? No, so I'll tell you a funny story. So I used to coach in Louisiana and down Woo! Yeah, I think Louisiana... I, I, I love Louisiana. Yeah, I think they have about 30 breweries. But with, back then, they didn't. Yeah. And so back then, it was, you know, the 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 whatever beers, macros. you know, the... Yeah, the... Macros. Ma the macro beers. Like the That's things a good that way to uh, say it. Alan yeah. Coelho might drink. Yeah. Like and, you know, Light. We, we, actually, we actually had a booster who was... He was the Miller Light distributor in, in our area. And so, like, if we were caught in a bar drinking anything but that, you know, it was kind of like we would lose money. So we had to drink that. But they didn't have craft brews. So I would go to Boise a lot um, at, to visit relatives. And in Boise, you know, you couldn't buy it at um, grocery stores or things. You had to go to the liquor stores. But I was introduced to craft beer there. And, you know, they sold it in the big bottles. And so I would go and I would buy about 10 bottles of this craft brew and wrap it up and bring it back to Louisiana with me and put it in my pantry. And then every month I would let myself have one because <laughs> it was like a treat. It was like this special thing to get this craft brew. But I, I mean, I loved it back then. And so then we moved to Washington and it's a huge thing and it's spread now to Louisiana. But it's so much bigger here. It's kind of like coffee, you know, right. kind of the same Definitely. idea. And, um, and so it was just like, wow, this is awesome. So I refuse to touch any of that other stuff. My husband will tell you that I, uh, I'm kind of stubborn about it. <laughs> I'm a beer snob for hey. official. We, we like our beer snobs, and we, we truly are excited that you moved from Louisiana to come here and coach at Eastern, and, and my understanding of coaching in the collegiate realm is that you have to be willing to move around quite a bit, but yet you've maintained being, this is about to be your 19th season as the head coach. Now, what's your secret to success at such a long tenure at one university? Well, you know, and you and I didn't talk about this, but I'm kind of like you in that I was a military brat growing up. And I moved every couple of years. And, and so, uh, you know, I think that that kind of changes your mindset when you become an adult and, and you're out in the world. And, and so I've been at two schools. And in 20, I was in Louisiana, was that 27 years, 28 years. So I've been coaching for 28 years and I've been at two schools. And it's because of, um, I think, partially just to want to dig into a place you know and want to be part of something because i didn't get that when i was a kid right right and you can you can relate i to can that. relate to that yeah. i can i can yeah so um so that's part of it and you know and then you know my husband and i have both um just really embedded ourselves in the community and it's a great place to raise our kids we love cheney we love this the pacific northwest yeah can't leave great friends um and, and so that's been a huge part of it, is that desire to be here. That's You know, right. I think that's where it starts. Right, definitely, definitely. And, and you're, you're talking, you've been 28 years. So I think about that. You, you've had the Generation X student athlete. 
the millennial student athlete, the Gen Z student athlete. I mean, the Association for Applied Sports Psychology has numerous articles on how to coach these students.